<laughs> oh dear. Okay, so James is going to start talking about the Ottoman Empire. He's um, working his way through the disc three now. Oh, there came, it came with a big package like this. Yeah, yeah it goes. This this is how the University of Alberta sends handsome, it stuff. Yeah. So is there a book? Then sent yeah, no book. Yeah, you eh? have the book. Oh, I do have it's the book. It's in there. your Okay, that's pile good. in my pile of stuff to read. Okay. That's it. In there somewhere is my course <laughs> textbooks, too. Yeah, okay, tell me when to stop. What is this, olive oil? Yeah. Probably stop now. I don't know if that's uh, good or bad or whatever. It's Another. how you like it. That's, okay. that's well, good. We'll see. You get it down. It'll be an experiment. I feel like a guinea pig. Okay. Anyway, the Ottoman Empire. They, lovely package here you know what I'm saying Kenneth W Harl is the dude doing this uh, stuff we've had him for at least one was it something medieval do you remember what it was uh, previous Vikings course. maybe Vikings okay what does he specialize in classical and Byzantine history yeah he might have done it but uh, anyway he's kind of got a, a weird way of presenting things he knows a lot of stuff mm-hmm. his favorite word is UH uh, it kind yeah. of gets a little bit... I know, it's, I find it difficult to listen to him. He's, yeah. He has a, oh, so much. He really yeah. has a lot of information. Yeah. But, um, and he rattles it off. It's just a yeah. constant stream of more and more information. I but, love it. And uh, sometimes I think it gets and to you, right? the subtitles are there. Very important, Which, you know. Yes, when you're going through a lot of information yeah. like that, and you don't necessarily, you yeah. aren't familiar with the, the names languages. or the, the yeah, languages. Anyway, I mean, uh, yeah, some, sure. some you hear jammy, jammy, and you don't realize that if you're looking in a book and you want to, a lot of people would be interested in Ottoman Empire because they're interested in visiting Turkey, right? Sure. You do the crate course, you'll get more out of visiting Turkey, right? I encourage people yeah, to take Yeah, definitely. Crate That's a good idea. You know, this thing for if you're visiting Turkey. Because otherwise people just visit hotels and they yeah. take a, a little uh, tour in a tour boat off the coast. And, you know, their image of in Turkey is some white hotels and some, I don't know what the hotels are like, but presumably for rich people. And then, uh, you know, like uh, some azure blue and Aegean or something like that. So, uh uh, you know, I, I think it's important to try to get an understanding of uh, present-day culture. In the uh, in Middle East, the uh, past is very, very important because that's what the law is set on. It's set on precedent uh, It goes back to Mohammed. So that's uh, 1,400 years ago, almost to the day. I think he started ruling over Medina in uh, 622 AD, so that's almost uh, 1,400 years ago. And uh, it's only approximate date, but it looks as though he got the call somewhere around 610. So that religion is over 1,400 years old. And so it's important to understand, you know, like what's going on there and things like that. So this guy has, uh, you know, that section where he was talking about Constantinople and architecture, and you're wondering what's the importance of that. For someone who's interested in just visiting Turkey and doing the tourist thing, he's helping people out, you know, he's telling. Uh, given I the history of right. the uh, mosques and things For like me, that. For me, though, I just hear... Um, a blither of names, right? Well, and it's like a mon- mon- monotonous... Everything sort of. starts with M, too, right? <laughs> I know. Mosque, which is just basically the same thing. Minaret, you see what I'm saying? And that's the influence of the Arabic language. It's a Semitic language, and Semitic languages no, I'm set up all sorts of stuff. No, I'm very thankful for having the gotten these yeah. courses out of the, from the University of Alberta. Thank you yeah. for sending them to me. Yeah. And thank you, Kenneth Harl, for... Laying this stuff off. Yes, laying there's it a on lot the of information there. Yeah. It's just not all going to get into my brain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there are uh, problems with that, but the thing is, about the six discs, there's, it's got to put provide the material for the disc. So there's a whack of information in there. It's almost like an encyclopedia's worth. I'm exaggerating somewhat, but you're getting the pictures in there and everything like that, and uh, it's quite impressive. That having been said, I would commend this for as a or recommend this as not necessarily commend it, but recommend it. Uh, if you're trying to get a base for things, 
but uh, you don't have to draw your judgments. I'm already drawing my Well, that's my really how the great courses courses. courses are set up. Well, that's the way they should yeah. be, right? Uh, people They're just should giving you an instruction. Be, uh, should be putting them together, you know? Sure. And then they should be doing outside reading. It's just yeah. like taking a real course in real life, outside reading. And uh, so I'm, you know, like you were asking uh, so I, about the, so this is like this, what were you saying, three or something like that? So halfway through. Yeah, that through, you're working on. We're doing, uh, we're talking about Constantinople, Ottoman, Constantinople. You're saying, what's the important? I'm saying, look at these mosques. Look at these various sorts of buildings. I was saying there was a one that's called the Hagia, Hagia Irene. And I'm saying, well, that's not originally a monastery. I think that's in part of the, uh, the Sultan's Palace complex or whatever. Uh, it's, you know, that's stolen from the Christians. It's important to understand that. You know, like uh, this, uh, this city was stolen from Christians and it was stolen from Greeks, where those two in intersected. This is really a Greek city. It's uh, been colonized, imperialized, and subjugated by foreign people, people who actually originated in Siberia. I'm not making it up. That's what linguists say. And when you look at the geography, the spread of the Turkic people, no. the Turkish people are part of it. That's where they belong. Now, so the thing is, you know, uh, uh, my ancestors, many of them don't belong in this area. And the important thing is when you move into someone else's area, you've got to treat those someone else's, not as others, but you've got to actually treat them with uh, due respect and thankfulness. And I don't think Greeks have been treated with due respect and thankfulness, nor have Christians in Constantinople, nor in Turkey. So, for example, roughly in my dad's lifetime, this is the way it's presented in the... Uh, in the uh, I won't say traditional accounts, the modern accounts of what happened, is there was an exchange of populations after World War II, a little bit after World War II. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so there's a little bit, it wasn't uh, one for one, it was, uh, it wasn't a two for one, but it was one and a half for one. So one and a half million Greeks for a million Turks. So they were exchanged across the board. The big trouble is Turks aren't native to the area where they were getting cleared out. So it was a form of ethnic cleansing. And the big trouble is, you see, like when you ethnically cleanse people from their native lands, to me, that's worse than when you ethnically cleanse people who are imperialist conquerors and colonizers. It's just, it's not, there's not a reciprocity there, I'm sorry. And when it's not one for one, then there's a problem. You know, 50% more Greeks were sent back to back yeah, they were sent away from their homeland. We've got records from the Hittites based on conventional dating that would date back to roughly to 1400 BC that locate Greeks in the western part of present-day Turkey. That's a long time ago. And they were finally ethnically cleansed, almost all of them, many, many of them, one and a half million. What is that, 1900 plus 1400 years is what is that 20 30 300 years <laughs> well it doesn't get much more native than that we don't know how much earlier they had been there in the western part of present-day turkey before the hittite annals start uh, mentioning it they actually uh, one of the things that occurs to me is they are actually the natives there you know some people say the greeks actually came from uh asia into Europe and not uh, from the northern part of Greece, from Europe into uh, Greece. And if that's the case, then they were, I'm sorry, in the western part of Turkey way before they're mentioned by the Hittites. The Hittites would have been a layer of people that came in later, maybe 1650 BC or something like that. But the Greeks had uh, preceded them. So, um, we're looking at the mosque and I'm saying, look at them. You know, like uh, some of them are stolen. You know, Hagia Sophia, or the uh, Hagia Sophia, Hagia Sophia, that means Saint Sophia. That's a Christian saint, right? And this uh, mosque, oh, uh, church, was put up uh, roughly 500 AD, I think a little bit before then. And, uh, but roughly around there, might have been a little after. 
And then uh, it, uh, what this guy was saying was it was turned into a mosque the day, day or day after uh, Constantinople was, or Istanbul was uh, overwhelmed by the uh, by the o Ottomans. And uh, well, that's not right. That's called appropriation, and it's, uh, it doesn't matter who's doing appropriation to whom. It's not right, and it doesn't matter when it was done. When you take over someone's holy site, you should you should actually treat it with respect. You should, when you take over the land around it, should be maintained as the holy site. You notice it wasn't right. You know, we converted the Christian population, and they turned into Muslims, and uh, you know, and then they decided to turn it into a mosque. Did you notice that it was the day? It was uh, mm -hmm. Istanbul was taken over. It was just appropriated. Uh, that is stolen from the Christians. Well, uh, you know, like that's not something to celebrate. This guy's got a Turkish wife, and I only found that af after I was looking at him saying, "Yeah, you know, like I'm getting a uh, a kind of a skewed view of events. You know, like it's not very objective." So we're looking at the architecture, and I, I'm saying to Pauline, "Look at those domes. They're impressive. Wow, you know." Like uh, these were all put up by definition after 1453, the ones that are mosques, uh, the Muslim sort of things. When was the dome invented? Well, the dome was invented by the Romans. The Pantheon apparently was the first dome ever put up. And that is almost 1500 years before then. So I don't see any innovation. Yes, it looks wonderful and beautiful and I'm awestruck. The interiors are awesome and stuff like that, but the actual technology hasn't changed much. I guess the compound dome, I've got to be careful about this because I could have got the details wrong, was invented in Hagia Sophia. Basically what we're seeing is just remakes of the Hagia Sophia done hundreds of years later, hundreds just repeated. Minaret, that's got to be a Muslim innovation. What does NR, that root mean? Uh, in uh, there's a third part of it I've forgotten what it is but the N R means light minaret you see how it's got an N and an R in there it's got an M at the beginning it's got a T at the end that changes it from light but the light stays at the center what is it it's a lighthouse these lighthouses that are minarets they were actually copied in, from the Greeks okay the Greeks invented the lighthouse uh, in that kind of form and it's probably significantly older than the dome. So these sorts of things that we think of as characteristically Muslim are actually taken from other people. And it's good to take things from other people that way. It's not good to go steal well, their holy sites. It's, in, yeah, it's exactly good right. To information learn from should be free. You yes. know, like uh, uh, you know, after a suitable time, a copyright for a person's life. After they die, the copyright should go, you know, on, on something written. Uh, for uh, something invented, uh, the patent should last for longer than the person's lifetime. But, uh, yeah, maybe uh, something like that. But uh, beyond that, then information should be free, right? So, and as nice people actually would just have a, you know, like if I publish a book or something like that, I think I'll just have a free copyright in. Because I just uh, am interest, interested in that information getting out there. Information is well. That's what we're doing free. here. Our yeah, information we're just giving is, this sort of free. stuff out. You know, like uh, whatever. So uh, yeah, you know, like uh, uh, what it does is it illustrates how the Ottoman Empire wasn't really going anywhere. He's talking about the way they're fighting, and he's saying, "Man, their army was the equal of anything in Europe." And I'm going, oh, okay. He's saying they had arquebuses, flintlocks, mu muskets. Hold on, who invented those things? I don't know, tell. That's the Europeans. So the thing is, he was saying, you know, basically he's saying he, they were providing themselves with these arms, but they weren't initially producing them. They could even produce cannons like on the European style, but they weren't inventing them. So, of course they're going to fall behind. Now, why does that happen? Here's what one guy who's an expert on Islam was saying in a course on Islam. Every religion needs its Constantine. Sheesh. Constantine's a bad guy in the Christian tradition. I'm not in the Christian tradition, but I can see that's when the Christian tradition started losing its uh, ethnic, or not ethnic, but uh, ethical ground 
And if more importantly than that, that's when you start getting a separation of church and state going the way of the dinosaur, the Christianity. <laughs> there was definitely separation of church and state. Up until Constantine, there were uh, by times official, uh, worse than pogroms, uh, crushings or attempted crushings of Christianity. There was sure they were feeding them churches. to lions. Yeah, exactly right, and that's not made up. They no. they were being fed to beasts and stuff like that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and then all of a sudden Constantine comes along, and you can see the results of that sort of stuff in places where uh, the Roman Catholic Church came after that, and you can see the results economically. You can actually see the results of Protestantism. You can see the results. Uh, there was some degree of separation of church and state once uh, the Pope became separate from the head of, uh, you know, Constantine was off in the East, right? And the Pope is in Rome. And what eventually happened, it, it took a, a while, but it was a little after 1000 AD, maybe, let's say 1050, there was official separation of the two churches. And the important thing about that is it separated the Pope. All of a sudden, the Pope's just sitting there, and there were some five times papal states and stuff like that, but he was a separate authority to most of the states you had out there. You had kings and stuff like that. So even within the Roman Catholic tradition, there is somewhat of a separation of church and state. But you can see in the uh, place where they maintained, i.e. the Byzantine Empire and the things that followed the Eastern Orthodox Church, there is much less separation of church and state than there is in Roman Catholic domains. And with the Roman Catholic domains, there's much less or, uh, separation of church and state than there is in Protestant domains. And there's a transitive relationship. You know, the Protestant domains have much, much less or much, much more separation of church and state than in the Eastern Orthodoxy. Now, let's look at economic development along the way. In each one of these things, economic development is just a function, more, uh, all other things being equal, of how much learning has been allowed. Learning and discovery. Because learning by itself means nothing. you got to discover. And what you see is in the Eastern Orthodox areas, the behind. In the middle, you've got the uh, Roman uh, Catholic uh, domains and the things that have followed, even the secular stuff. Secular stuff in the Eastern Orthodox, that's the Soviets. Behind, but they're a little bit ahead of uh, the Eastern Orthodox. And then you got the Protestant stuff, I don't have to tell you. And the more Protestant they were in terms of uh, allowing separation of church and state. I'm not talking, you know, the Lutheran stuff, a little bit behind up until quite recently. Up until quite recently, it's behind places like Holland and uh, England. Eventually, they got uh, fairly good at technical stuff, let's say, even, you know, as early as the 19th century, stuff like that. But before then, the Lutheran states, that's, the Lutheran states tended to have a official church. England did too, but it had much less of a hold on things. You had the Methodists, you had uh, the Calvinists and, and things like that, uh, breaking that monopoly of the Anglican Church, the official church. You have an official church, it's, there's less ch separation of church and state. So, uh, how does that uh, bear on the uh, Ottoman Empire? The Ottoman Empire did not have separation of church and state, even less than the Eastern Orthodox Church. Are, do we find that things are behind there? Yeah. And this is what happened, you know, like, it's a big mystery to some people. Why did they fall apart? You know, why did they fall behind the European? It is because of the lack of separation between church and state. And understand, I'm looking at things like, I look at belief systems. I look at the communists and its separation of church and party, or separation of party and state. They didn't have it, and they suffered as a result. Suffered economically, and suffered in any number of other ways. So, this guy is not picking up on this sort of stuff. He's saying, you know, they were up with the Europeans. No, they weren't with the, up with the Europeans right from the get-go. Right from the get-go, even before the Ottoman Empire. The, during the Crusades, the stuff, the, the, the Christians hardly had anything going for them. They maintained enclaves right on the mainland of Asia because they had superior ocean-going or sea-going, Mediterranean, um, 
technology. They were able to supply these enclaves. Say the same sort of thing when the Ottoman Empire moved into uh, Greece and the Balkans. You'll see that uh, for a long while the Venetians, this is just a small republic. Venice, that's a city. You see what I'm saying? It's a city-state. And it's able to maintain these enclaves all along the coast of Greece, uh, maintain islands and stuff like that. That's a wee little state. The Ottoman Empire is huge. It's bigger than the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire started in Italy. So the Venetian city-state is like a small part of Italy. And they're maintain, ma able to do the little uh, Jerry against Tom, against this Ottoman Empire. Finally, they, the Ottoman Empire finally ganged up on them and was able to force them out. But why were they able to do that? It's because of superior organization and technology. And what he's saying is, you know, finally, you know, the Ottomans forced them kind of to give up these sorts of things. And force, they're just going along. He was talking about it. It was a republic, right? That was a basic rule of the senators, but they're going along saying, this is costing us too much money, right? So we're just not going to maintain it. So what they did was they still traded with the Ottomans. They came up with some agreements and they pulled out of these uh, ports and stuff like that. So this is what happens when you get something like separation of church and state. People are going, okay, you know, like, uh, you even get like separation. You, you don't have a total empire, stuff like that. People are going, is it really worth fighting a war for some stupid idiot? No, it's not. You know, like it's going to cost the second only thing see so uh, yeah it's uh, ultimately I'm going to give you a talk I'll start it off I'll introduce this. it's just a new idea the guys heading this Ottoman Empire they're still behaving on the old thing so Proudhon and Marx following and people you know Warren Buffett was actually uh, citing it as a Marx thing property is theft no property big and the whole idea is property begins with theft and it's maintained by theft no, property begins as robbery. And there's a difference between robbery and theft. Theft is you take something away surreptitiously or whatever. Robbery is you say, I want your money or your, it's your money or your life or your health or whatever. It's taken by force or threat of force. And that's how it begins. And systems that were characterized by that were slave systems, right? It's not just taken away stuff. From, it's taken away continuously. They take away your freedom and they make you work for them. Okay? Then what comes is property as theft. And that's like the Middle Ages for most people. I understand this is the Middle Ages. This isn't even the Middle Ages. And they were still maintaining slavery. From 1450 to uh, 1790, according to this dude, and he's saying it's a minimum figure, the figure that I have gone with up to this point in time is two and a half million. But two, in 250 years, from Russia, Lithuania, Poland, and the Ukraine, the Ottomans took two and a half million people, according to the stats that I've run across, as slaves from those areas. You never hear about it. This guy says minimum three million. And understand, he is not looking to bash these guys. I'm going to go with the two and a half million. What that is, is 10,000 people a year are streaming into the Ottoman Empire. He was saying in in many households there'd be one or two slaves and then there'd be other slaves, you know, uh, just uh, the, the, the rich people of that. You can't do that. You see, that is property. The people are actually property. You see what I'm saying? Property as robbery, beginning as robbery and continuing as robbery when you're having slavery. The next stage is when you've got serfs and that's property as theft. You're stealing stuff from people so on and so forth the next stage and it's the stage that we're in right now is property as embezzlement and that's what capitalists do but what capitalists do is they do oligopoly and what they do is they hire workers and they embezzle from them. they take a certain amount because there's a, a, a uh, there's a uh, discrepancy in terms of power there's more workers uh, trying to get uh, a few jobs from these capitalists, very few capitalists on the other side of the equation. So they've got a huge advantage. They can play divide and conquer with the workers. And they do it. But it's not really conquering. It's embezzlement. The certain amount of the money that's owed to workers, they can keep to themselves because of their oligopoly situation. They do the same thing with consumers. There's a whole bunch of consumers, very few producers. 
and uh, they rip people off. They rip people off on the stock market. And I've never heard people talk about this, but that's what they do. There's very few of them putting out the stocks. There's more people buying stocks for their public, uh, publicly held company. They do embezzlement. Well, I'm telling you something. See, embezzlement is you got your fingers in the till and you're taking a little bit and you hope people don't notice. You see the difference between that and theft? When you get stolen from, you usually know. And when you get robbed, you definitely know because that's the whole idea. <laughs> now, the, so many people who are putative left-wingers. You keep going. Okay. Putative left-wingers. I call them regressive progressives. They've come up with solutions. Uh, Lenin had a solution. Marx had a solution. Stalin had a solution. Mao had a solution. And sadly, it seemed almost as bad as the final solution. And I shouldn't be joking about that. And I'm not saying it, it was as bad. But tens of millions of people got killed in these solutions. And what happened is, you know, you got social democrats getting involved in these movements. And the next thing you know, they're finding that they're getting themselves whacked. It was a lesson that they weren't able to apply because they got whacked by the by the commies. And what happened is they put into power, helped put into power, people who went, they're, they're trying to handle embezzlers, and they're putting in power people who aren't even thieves. They're putting into power people who are robbers. So the communists would send people off, kulaks, richer farmers, They'd send up bourgeois people. These would be professionals and stuff like that. And aristocrats, too. They'd send them off to work camps, and they'd work them literally to death. So that's slavery, right? That's slavery. So they're not, they're not even gone back to theft. They've gone back to property as robbery. Well, that's not a solution to embezzlement. That's like having uh, stem cell therapy for breast cancer. They tried that in the 80s, and it was worse than the uh, breast cancer itself. You saw that documentary, right? So it's just like ra a radical treatment that is worse than the uh, ori original stuff, which is a killer. Mm -hmm. So we'll be talking a little bit more about this sort of stuff. The trouble with the Ottoman Empire is it didn't go through that stage of getting rid of uh, slavery and maintained it. And, uh, you know, you had to see the end of the Ottoman Empire under Kamal Ataturk uh, to see, uh, I think it, he got he, you know, he tried to secularize and stuff like that. So, you're going to get the uh, real deal, you know, fasten your seatbelts in this one. <laughs>